Hi, I'm Scott. Welcome back to Scott Sin Stuff. This is episode four of the Poly 6 Restoration Series. Today, we are going to be doing power. And we're going to be dealing with some high voltage on the input, the transformer, uh, the new power supply, the new transformer. Um, and in honor of that, I have worn my Electro Boom t-shirt. Hopefully, we're not going to have any shocks or sparks or explosions. Coming up next. All right, so my goal for today's episode is to get the top portion of the panel into the new case. So we'll, we'll mount it into the case and then start on the power supply. Now, Unlike what Kiwi Technics has you do normally, where they just take the existing power supply, attach it onto their new power plate with the MIDI ports on it, and then pretty much use everything as is, I'm actually going to get rid of this old transformer um, because this old transformer, um, this ferret core type of transformer is kind of noisy and I'm really trying to get rid of the noise in the Poly 6 to give it the smallest noise floor possible. So in order to do that, I've ordered and received this uh, toroidal transformer with the sufficient specs that matches this transformer. So it has um, a center tap input, center tap output. You can put in either 240 or 120 volts in the input and you get uh, 18 center tap, 18 AC out, which is exactly what the power supply wants. So we'll graft this connector onto this transformer, connect the transformer into here. I'm hoping that there is some documentation on what, what yes there is right on there, which wire is which, so we'll know how to hook up that transformer. And I think that's it. So like Mike Patey says, back to work. All right, so a quick description. We're gonna start with the power supply input. We're going to take the switch off of there and we've got some of the wires that we're gonna use and some that we're not. If I uh, take these off of here and I'll save this little tie down because uh, we can use that in the, uh, the new case. And we can see our wires here. So we'll cut off these three input wires coming from the wall. So there's our neutral, hot, and ground, which you can see. And in order to replace or move the switch over to the, the new spot of the new plate, we're going to have to desolder that. So uh, I'm not going to bother getting the desoldering pump out for that. We'll just use the soldering iron. Now we can just squeeze the uh, ends of this switch and push it through. And apart from the serial plate, we'll be finished with this. We aren't going to need this anymore. Uh, we may need to transplant a ground lug, which you can see right there, but uh, uh, we may be able to find on the, another way of using that. We'll put the switch with the same orientation with the red lettering up into the new back panel, just like that. Then we'll strip the wires that go to that switch. Okay, and then uh, we'll just solder those back in, into the switch. And for this, it doesn't matter which wire goes to which terminal on the switch. Okay, so the IEC plug that we're using here now uh, has three wires coming out the back and you may not be familiar with the color codes, green, is ground, our brown is the line or the hot, and the blue is neutral. And on the AC input here, you can see our black, which is the, uh, they have that as C and H. I don't know what C and H stand for. However, black is hot 
white is neutral, green is ground. So what we're going to do is wire these three wires in place of these, these three right here. Which of course means we have to desolder those first. All right, so I've desoldered the wires there, and as you can see, the terminals are very, very thin, and I managed to break these this this uh, hot terminal off entirely. Not a big deal. We can just tack solder right to that very large pad right there. So that's what we'll do. So we can before we actually start that. Right here is a spark killer. This is a special type of capacitor. They call it a protective capacitor or a safety capacitor. It's a polypropylene capacitor, and its job is to absorb uh, sparks that might be induced on the electric lines from noise or lightning or, or any kind of interference. They do break down after a while. This one is 30, 40 years old, so I have purchased a replacement. Uh, again, these are from Mouser. There is the uh, part number if you want to buy it. But that's that's what you want to make sure that it is a uh, 0.33 microfarads or 0 0.033 microfarads and 440 volts. You want it rated for. Now, the one thing you do have to know about these polypropylene capacitors is they cannot tolerate much heat. So I've got to turn down my. Uh, why is it going up? Oh, down. I gotta, push. I gotta turn down my soldering iron down to, oh, I'm gonna say 400 degrees. And you have to do this really quick. You, can, you don't have much time to, to solder these, only maybe five seconds. So you, you do have to be careful when you solder these polypropylene capacitors in place. Because they will melt. They are polypropylene inside. They are encapsulated in resin and fireproof resin. So if they do absorb a spark uh, such that it breaks down the internals and it, it in, like unlike, unlike some capacitors where they will explode and spew fire out, this one will not because it's, it's intended to be a safety capacitor. And there should be a UL mark on there somewhere. Yeah, right there. If you look UL, Underwriters Laboratory, you want to make sure, and you have, if you see right there, there's actually an Underwriters Laboratory symbol there. So that's what you want to look for in a safety capacitor. So let's pull this one off. And I guess I probably should have spooled up my uh, pump for this, but oh well, I'm not going to wait because it takes a while to heat up. So let's just do this with solder wick. Oh, duh. That's not gonna work because I just turned the heat down on my soldering iron. Well, I guess we'll use the pump after all. That was a lot of work. So let's get the replacement in there. This is the tricky part where we have to do very quick soldering, with not a lot of heat. I think that will do. Hopefully that wasn't on long enough to cause a problem. All right, so that's that's our new protective spark killing capacitor there. Here's our ground lug. And we can solder our ground onto here. Our neutral or blue goes onto the end. 
and the hot goes in the middle here, which is the brown one. This is going to take a little bit extra doing because I don't have a uh, tab to physically con to connect it. So I'm just going to have to heat that up and tack solder it in place. And that will do. So now we have our new panel connected to the old switching and uh, fuse protect the protection panel. Now we will remove the old transformer. So the old transformer has a few different connections on it. This one says no connection. We can clip that. We have our line and load outputs here with a ground in the middle. And this one also has a ground here. We'll clip that as well. So there is our old transformer. We will be using the green wires and connector off of here, so let's clip that free. The, we will need to strip these so that we can bind them to the new transformer. So this is 18 volts, 18 volts, and then a center tap between the two. Going to the transformer, we have the uh, line and load so the transformer that we've got here is a toroid transformer. I have actually put uh, some MAR connectors on the end of these. You can see this is actually a, a dual input, dual output. So there's a center tap on both the input and the output. The input is on the blue, gray, and violet brown, which is these here. So if we were gonna be hooking this up to 240 volts, I would connect the gray and the violet together and then I would put the 240 volts in it between the blue and the brown. And that way I would get 18 volts here and 18 volts here. But because I'm only putting 110 in, what I'm doing is I'm gonna put in 110 across the blue and the gray, the violet and brown will remain unconnected. However, I can't just leave them hanging free because it will get 110 volts or 120 volts induced across it. So there will be lethal voltage on the end of this. So we're gonna have to terminate that and make sure it doesn't contact anything. I actually changed my mind on this later. Yes, you could do it that way, but rather than having just the secondary set of parallel inputs hanging unused, I, what I did is I actually hooked them up in parallel with the other set of inputs. That way you're using the entire input coil structure. You're not uh, restricting yourself to only one set of coils. It also means because you're running those coils in parallel, you're using the full power capacity of the transformer, which means it's going to be running less uh, hard because it's sharing the load between those two input coils, which means it's going to run cooler, which means it's going to last longer. Uh, I actually explain this uh, once I make that decision much later in this video, but I thought I would bring it up right in this part of the video in case anybody's following this along and, and decides they're going to do the same thing. Don't do what I did here doing them in parallel like I show later on in the in the video. For the output, we'll be connecting red and orange together, and that will be our center tap, and then the green will connect to the black and, and yellow each, and that will be our new transformer. We'll just hook up our primary connections here. The output, like I said, we're going to bond the red and orange together, and that will go to the black wire. So we need to strip those just a little bit longer. any luck, I can now plug 
this IEC plug that I have handy into this jack and get my meter ready and we should be able to read 18 volts center tapped on that connector right there. So I'm going to plug it in now. Hopefully no sparks, no explosions. So far so good. I don't know if it's turned on or not right now so let's just check if we have power coming into here. It shows 24 volts. That's an interesting voltage. Okay, let's check what we have coming into the plug here. 122 volts, that's fine. Cross the fuse, nothing, so the fuse is good. Cross the switch, uh, 127 volts, so it's turned off. Interesting that we have, oh, I know why. There's a capacitor inside here, so the capacitor in this filter is holding voltage. So. I'm going to turn the switch on. We should now have 120 volts right here, which we do, and we should have 120 volts coming out of here. Which we do. All right, so I got my back probes here, and on this one we'll stick in the center tap. On this one, we should see 18 volts AC or thereabouts. So we got 21, that's fine. And this one, 21 again. So looks like that's good. So the next stage in the process is to join this beautiful new case with the original top of the Poly 6. So the, the manufacturer of this case does say that if you're not careful, you can actually scratch and scrape off some of the finish when you're putting the uh, top on. So it says to be very careful, make sure it's exactly perfectly centered. And you can even maybe just spread the, uh, the cheeks out just a little bit as you move it on. Now, I did originally think I was gonna remove these cable ties on the back of the Poly 6, but then I thought, you know what? That's part of the original synth. Even though it no longer has a use, I think I'll leave it there. So we'll hook on the one hinge and then pull this one up and over the other hinge. Okay, so that wasn't too hard to get it hooked on there. And now we can start with the power supply uh, installation. So to begin, let's install the Kiwi 6 power supply board in here. So here's the Kiwi 6 power supply. It's gonna go right in there. We do need the backing plate that uh, bonds right to there to give us thermal uh, transfer. And so that gets sandwiched in between the actual power supply and the back panel. So before we install it, we need to apply some thermal grease. This is what I have here. As you can see, it's brand new. And they give you a big jar that has almost nothing in it, typical. Smear some of this grease onto the back of this here and you don't have to worry this is not some of that nasty beryllium that uh, it's going to kill you if you get it on your skin you don't need a whole lot but it does you do want to make sure it is all covered and you can spread it kind of thin all right so that's good for that probably more than I need, but uh, it's better to have too much than too little. And that's going to fit right back here. We see if we can actually line it up with these holes and get it to stick into place. The other place where we're going to have heat transfer grease is right here. We don't care about this one on the bottom, but on the top where the transistors are, uh, where these, these regulators are, it's gonna dump all the heat into this, and so we wanna make sure it transfers the heat out of that into this. So now we just have to install this and screw it in place. All right, that's now on there. That's, that was really quite a bit harder than it should have been. 
I don't know why it was so difficult to get those holes lined up, but it really was. So we can actually mount this panel right in there. Why don't we go ahead and do that? You know, I'm starting to think that it probably would have been a lot easier to have mounted the power supply and that back panel in the top before we mounted it in the case, but uh, you know, t hindsight's 2020. Okay, so for the uh, protection panel here, we need this fireproof paper installed. The idea is that if this were to catch fire or otherwise uh, something bad were to happen it were in, and it were to spurt flame out the bottom, instead of igniting this wood that it's sitting on, it will be quenched by this uh, special paper here that uh, will stop the flames. Many, many, many years ago in a different life, I actually did testing on exactly this type of uh, paper. And you know, basically we had electronic devices that you had to simulate a power line falling across a phone line, for instance, and then the, the device was not allowed to spurt flame out onto whatever it was sitting on. So the original transformer would fasten right here with these tie uh, screw down points that have been included in this new case. However, the toroidal transformer doesn't use that type of tab screw down like the original transformer. I'm going to put it right there and how it goes in place is it has a single bolt that goes through the center and holds it in. So I'm going to drill a hole in there to accept that bolt. Check we have clearance of that bolt. Yep, fits great. So then we have the the bolt that goes on the top through the center of the transformer. Then we have this rubber bushing on the bottom through the hole. And make sure everything is seated just where we want it to be. And then a washer and a bolt on the bottom. Oh, and I don't know if you noticed, I realized that the using only half of the primary in my transformer, I'm only using half the capacity of the transformer, which means half the load, it's gonna run hotter. So I thought, well, that's stupid. I'm gonna go ahead and just double up the, the or put the um, two primaries in parallel. So you can see I've actually soldered the purple to the blue and the gray to the brown on the primaries so that uh, both primaries are being used at the same time. That'll help the transformer run cooler and last longer. And we'll just screw that in place. There is a grounding lug that goes on right here. So we'll, that grounds the case to the input. So we'll install that. So the next thing we really need to do is a test of the power supply. Let's tighten up the transformer so we know it's not going anywhere. And then we will plug it in, power it up, and test to make sure that our output, output voltages are all correct. At least a moment of truth, important step. We're about to power up the power supply for the first time. So I've plugged in the 110, it's live. We're gonna switch it on. We have a light that lights up here, a little LED that lit up. That's a good sign. Looks like the power supply has come up okay. Nothing else is actually connected. The power supply is not plugged into anything, but uh, uh, we do want to measure the rail voltages. So we're going to measure from ground to plus 5 volts. There we go, 5.0, that's good. Plus 15, 15.06, good. Plus five here, another plus five, minus five, and minus 15. Perfect. All those are good. So what we're gonna do now is let it sit and burn in for 15 or 20 minutes, just to let it heat up and uh, make sure that all the components are properly burned in. And once that has occurred, we'll come back, remeasure it, and make any adjustments to the voltages as needed. Okay, we've had a little bit of a burn in, so let's do a check and adjustment. 
We'll start with a plus 15 volts. Then plus 5 volts. Good enough. And then we'll do minus 15. And minus 5. The next step is to reconnect everything and power it up. Then we'll readjust the power again. If you notice, the connectors have a number on it that goes with connector number on the board. So this says eight on it. And if you look, there's connector eight. All right, so using a combination of pictures that I took along with matching the connector uh, numbers on the actual connectors, the pigtail ends along with the connectors on the board. Um, of course, this one here, I, well, I just wanted to have a look and make sure that they, I was looking at the correct connector numbers, one, two, 13, and 16 on the old board and the same thing with the CPU board. So that's all good. The only thing remaining is this 5-volt wire, which gets hard soldered right onto that 5-volt uh, point right there. So we'll do that, and once we've soldered that in place, I think we're ready to power this up. This is it, the moment of truth. I'm going to plug it in. I've gone over the boards, I've gone over the, the connections, I've double checked and triple checked everything. It looks like it's all hooked up correctly. We're gonna turn it on and hopefully no smoke comes out. Here we go, three, two, one, and it instantly went off. Not good, not good at all. It looks like we may have blown a fuse. Let's unplug it and try and figure out what happened. I saw the power light right on the power supply come on for an instant and then it went off. So that tells me we may have blown a fuse. Yep, it looks like we've blown both of these fuses. Let's check this one over here. That one's okay. So something happened. Something's not right. All right, well, that looks like it's gonna be the end of the work for tonight because I don't think I have another one of these one amp fuses. This one is a one amp slow blow and this is also another one amp slow blow. Um, I don't know what the input is for these. I don't know if that's actually AC or DC that's there. You know what, let's just measure it and see. Actually, I can look at it on this board. And it looks like, yes. So that, that is a fuse right across the, the uh, AC input from the transformer. So we drew a ton of current instantaneously and caused the input fuses to blow for some reason. I'm not quite sure why yet. Um, I guess I'll have to check and see if I have any more fuses. All right, so I have plugged in the cable that goes from the Kiwi 6 to its MIDI board, this this right here. The other cables I've tidied up, uh, you know, put in the, the, the various places where they're supposed to live, just to give the cabling, make it a bit neater. We need to install our ground plane connection here that connects the output jack here to the ground plane right there. Now, I guess we can do it pretty much anywhere. Let's how about that's a nice convenient spot right there. And that's what um, gives the, the ground plane its, uh, its connection to ground. That's about all we can do tonight. I'm gonna get some fuses tomorrow. All the stores are closed right now, so I'll get some replacement fuses here 
And what we'll do is we'll unplug all these different modules from the power supply board, power it back up, and then one by one, we'll plug them back in and see which of the, the modules that we plug in is actually causing the fuses to blow. And that's how we'll start uh, figuring out what is going on and where, where this problem is coming from. All right, the next day is rolled around. I've got some fuses now. The correct size, one amp, and these are actually fast blow. They're not slow blow. These are supposed to be slow blow. They didn't have any. I've ordered some, but in the meantime, we'll do what we can with these. However, a package of two of these that are the correct size, the 20 millimeter fuses, was $8. That's ridiculous. Home Depot is just ripping people off. I ordered a pack of, uh, I think about 20 of these off Amazon. I think it was like $5 for 20. Of course, it won't be here for five days. But a package of four of the uh, quarter inch ones was only $3. So what I'm going to do for testing purposes, seeing as this is gonna cause a bunch of these fuses to blow, is I'm gonna rig these up outboard. Obviously I can't put quarter inch fuses in here, but I will put these uh, alligator clips onto the fuse terminals. And then we'll just rig up these fuses on the other end. So the fuses are still in the circuit, they just aren't actually fitted into the board. Then what we'll do is we'll unplug these four connectors and then we'll plug them back in one at a time and see uh, if there's one of them that causes these fuses to blow. And then we'll disconnect these four power connectors from the circuit board. Okay, so now we should be able to power this up and it should just turn on, which is exactly what we see. So next we will plug in the first of the four, which is this uh, one that is running the effects board. All right, that's still running fine. So we'll check it again. 15, five, minus five, minus 15, all good. Next we'll plug in the gray, which is running this console board here, the, the control board. And that's plugged in fine. Once again, check the power. 15, minus five, or plus five rather, minus five, minus 15, all good. Next we have connector two. That's one, this is two, so two goes into this connector right here. And that is what powers the Kiwi 6 board. Up and running. 15, five, minus five, minus 15. I do notice the minus five is down a little bit, or and the minus 15 is down a little bit, so we are putting a little bit of a load on it. But it's a good sign that uh, the QE6 board is functioning. All right, the last one is the voice board. So let's plug that in and see what happens. And what happens is nothing. It did not blow. So we got 15, five, minus five, minus 15. Okay, so it appears that everything is on. The fuses have not blown. So I wonder, it's possible that the old fuses were just uh, not in good shape and, and the surge of turning on took them out. That's a possibility. Uh, what I am going to do is, is I'm going to power the synth off and then I'm going to power it back on and see if the fuses hold through that. So we'll do a power cycle here. We'll turn it off. 
and expect that the power goes off as, as we would expect. Now we'll turn it back on and it powers up. Okay, so it's possible that it was just bad fuses and there's actually nothing wrong. The LFO, it's now flashing. So it looks like that's actually functioning. Okay, so what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna turn it off and now I'm gonna replace my jury rigged fuse here with an actual one amp fuse. We'll put the proper fuses in there, even though they are fast blow and it's supposed to be slow blow, but we'll put what I have in there and we'll see what happens. Also possible is that the surge of powering up those electrolytics the first time perhaps uh, caused the, the fuses to blow, but let's try and see what happens here. Okay, so we'll power it up and they blew instantly. So what is causing it to blow? And that's $7 a fuse, $8 a fuse as I just blew there. Two hours later. All right, I think I've got this fixed. This has taken me down a crazy rabbit hole that's taken me a couple hours to sort through, but I'm pretty sure that I've got it nicked now. So let me show you what I did. What I knew was when I was powering it up with all four of these connectors connected on the power supply, Sometimes it was blowing the one amp slow blow fuse here. And when that happened, it would blow both fuses. And I think it was a cascading failure. I think one fuse was blowing and then the sudden load on the other fuse was causing it to blow as well, which is fine. If you want fuses to blow, you want them all to blow at once. However, it wasn't happening every time. It would happen every like third or fourth time you powered it up. So then I disconnected all of these four connectors and started powering it up one at a time to see if any of the uh, boards that it was driving was actually the cause of it. And if I had any one of these plugged in, it was fine. If I had two of them plugged in and I tried all different combinations and I couldn't get it to happen unless all four boards were plugged in, which to me tells me that it's not any one of these boards that has a problem. It's just overall the amount of power being pulled at startup. So then what I did is on my, my silly rig full of here of alligator clips and so on, what I did is I put a one ohm resistor across the input and then I put a, an oscilloscope across that resistor so that I'm using this one ohm resistor as a current shunt. And that allows me to, to to measure, instead of voltage, I'm measuring the current. So what I get then is a voltage going to the oscilloscope that is equivalent, or at least uh, scalable to the amount of current being pulled on the input of the power supply. What I was trying to do then was to get, it, to be able to visualize the sudden inrush of current that was blowing those fuses and see if I could identify it and how much of a problem it was. And that's exactly what I did. I, I set up the oscilloscope here and you can see it, it's off here. And then when I turn it on, you can see it turns on. And in fact, I'll do it right now. So if I uh, reset that, and as soon as I turn it on, there we go. So now you can see it was off and then I switched it on and you can see the, uh, the, the current being pulled, and it is AC current. It is, I mean, it's showing voltage here, but that's how you measure across a current shunt. So it's showing a two volt per division. So what I was seeing, when I wrote down here, so I was seeing a, a peak to peak of 5.8 volts, which was the normal amount of current being pulled. If I just run it there, you can see here's, here's what we're running. This is, the synth is now actually running. You can see it's, it's stuff is flashing, it's all working. So the synth is actually running, and in doing so, this is the amount of current it's pulling. So what I saw was sometimes when all four boards were plugged in and I would start it up, there would be a, a very, very brief spike, and you can see it here. I took video and pictures of that spike of the, the uh, inrush current. So am I concerned about that current? No, I'm not. What I'm going to do, uh, if for now is I'm gonna put a, a, a pair of uh, one and a half amp fuses in here instead of one. And when the slow blow fuses arrive, because remember I said these are fast blowing fuses, I suspect when the slow blow fuses come, um, they will fix this problem because the spike that I was seeing, that inrush spike, it's it's microseconds long. It's a, it's a big current spike, but it's so short. And what a 
a slow blow fuse is supposed to do is absorb enough heat for those brief spikes so that they don't blow. And I think what the problem was, was the fuses that were in this were not slow blow fuses. And that's been the cause of this all along. So in order to go forwards, I'm gonna put the one and a half amp fuses in there, which will run. They have enough uh, headroom in there that they aren't gonna blow from that spike. And we can go ahead and get the, the voltage adjustments done and maybe the calibrations, and then we'll do the grounding and get this synth buttoned up. Okay, so the synth has been powered up for about half an hour, so everything is good and warm. Uh, I'm going to adjust the voltage of the power supply. We did it once with nothing, with no load on it. And now we're gonna do it again with a full load with it warm and drawing as much as it would be during normal operation. So we will start again with the plus 15 volt rail. And we'll bring that down just a touch. Okay, 15 volts. Next, we'll do the five volt rail. That one's really close. And this one's pretty sensitive, so it's not gonna take much. Minus 15. Actually, we do it in order, yes. Minus 15, and that's dead on. And then the minus five. So that's calibrated the power supply. The next thing we need to do is to put the key bed in it because the next step is to calibrate this synthesizer and to do so we have to be able to play notes. So let's get the key bed in here. We'll go ahead and plug in the key bed into the voice board. I've plugged in an audio cable from the output to my rack. We turn it on, we'll turn the volume down, let it settle. We'll bring the volume up and see what happens. Nothing. No sound. Okay, what's going on? All this work and we have no sound coming out of it. So now I'm starting to panic a little bit. Do we have a serious problem with this synth? We got the fuse issue solved. However, there's absolutely not the slightest bit of sound coming out of the synthesizer. So I originally had planned that this was going to be the last rebuild and, and restoration video in the series. This is gonna be episode four, it's gonna be the final one. However, as I'm editing this video, I realize if I do that, this video is going to be an hour and a half or two hours long and, and nobody's going to sit and watch that. So I'm going to split the episode four in half and there will be an episode five to this series. With that being that we are now at uh, 42 minutes for this episode, I'm going to cut this one here. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions especially, please leave them in the comments below. I always read all those comments and I respond to them as much as I can. If you do like this video, please click like, subscribe, uh, click the little bell. You get notified every time we post updates. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.